Hello and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini. I am the Executive Director of the Rackley Fellowship Program here at Harvard University. Our Rackley Fellow speaker today is Ndubueze El Mba, a historian of Atlantic Age West Africa. Dubuese's work has been lauded for his skillful combination of oral, archival, and material culture research, as well as his close attention to a on the ground life of those often ignored by studies of colonial rule. In his first book, Emergent Masculinities, Dubuese traced out changes in gender practices occurring in the Bight of, Af of Biafra region between 1750 and 1920. His work moves beyond the division of pre-colonial and colonial history to tell a more complete story of power relations. He reveals how gender relations in West Africa shape slavery in British Caribbean. Ndubuese has published his research on West Africa in journals, anthologies, and film documentary, helping to expand historiography on African and global histories of gender and sexuality. At Ratcliffe, he's writing his second book, rec recovering the stories of Nigerian men, women, and children who use forgery to survive forced labor after the end of the Atlantic slavery. And Dubuese uses traces of archival forgeries to follow Nigerian transcolonial migrants as they move across Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon in response to abolitionism. Dubuese says that his soccer days are long gone and he now, he now enjoys watching his kids building imaginary villages with magnet tiles. Of course, he also loves to do so his research, especially because he gets to discover new places through food. It is a pleasure to present this year's Joy Foundation Fellows, Ndubueze El Mba. Thank you so very much, Claudia. I am delighted to be here for this opportunity to share my work with you. I thank the amazing staff of the Radcliffe Institute, Claudia, Sharon, Elizabeth, Allison, Jane, Maria, Kayla, and Jay. Thank you for creating such a supportive environment. Thank you for Nespresso. Thank you for care.com. I'm grateful uh, for my Radcliffe uh, research partners. Could you please stand, those of you right here? Uh, um, Florian, Jalen, Rico, Erica, Emily, and Anna. So my partners have translated German, French, and Spanish language sources processed a diverse range of English language archives, and really helped me to fine tune my interpretation of archival documents. I also want to thank my fellow fellows for being inspiring teachers and role models over these past months. At Radcliffe, I have been writing my second book, Abolition Forgery a history of the afterlives of slavery. In the book, I examine how abolition myth-making incubated the afterlives of slavery. First, I'm going to introduce you to my theory of abolition forgery. Second, I will discuss abolition forgery from the perspective of African imperial subjects and finally, I will explain how abolition forgery shaped gender hierarchy in West Africa. In 1900, Jan Powell, an African-British subject, petitioned a British colonial governor and complained that he had been recruited along with nine other Africans and transported to the Spanish colony of Fernando Po in present-day Equatorial Guinea for wage labor 
on a cacao plantation. Jampao and others refused to accept the terms of their Spanish labor contract, which was so different from the terms of the English language contract that they had signed at the initial point of recruitment on the Gold Coast, that it resembled slavery. But the Spanish planter subjected Jampao and the others to several days of quote-unquote severe treatment and punishment. He tied up the laborers on a tree, placed fire under the tree to burn or roast them. Afterwards, he charged them with desertion, which enabled the colonial police to imprison the laborers for vagrancy, and then subject them to penal labor on the island. Some of the laborers escaped into the forest, where they eked out a living for several days, before Jampao smuggled himself onto an outbound ship to Lagos. So this is the Gold Coast here, and Jampao was taken from the Gold Coast to Fernando Po, and then got on a boat and made it to Lagos. And from Lagos, he wrote the petition to the British colonial governor. British officials concluded that because Jampao and the others consented to a contract at the point of recruitment before transport to Fernando Po, they were not victims of forced labor, but willful beneficiaries of free labor. Their torture and imprisonment were legitimate punishment for vagrancy. So what Jampao and the others experienced is what I call coerced contract. And coerced contract illustrates abolition forgery, by which I mean the use of free labor discourse to disguise violent forced labor. European officials went to great lengths to justify forced labor and define it as not slavery, because imperialism itself had been justified as a mission to end slavery and propagate free labor. In Jampao's case, imperial officials used vagrancy to dismiss torture and disguise the coercion of contract. The contract symbolized abolition's free labor. It did not matter if torture produced it. Jampao's case reminds us that imperialism was not based on violent conquest alone, but relied on the ideology of abolition. When African people like Jampao wrote petitions against forced labor, they were challenging imperial state's hypocrisy to conceal the mirage of abolition. Sites of violent imperial forced labor in Africa were remote, on ships, mines, factories, and plantations, beyond the censorious gaze of colonial and metropolitan people. Although legal and state-mandated documents, such as treaties, contracts, and passports, were used to traffic imperial subjects into those forced labor sites, recruitment still required propaganda, deception, and force. Moreover, to retain laborers in those sites required the concealment of violence and the denial of forced labor. So Africans like Jampao resisted by voting with their feet. They walked away or ran away, or by calling out abolition as a hoax. African hypermobility and appropriation of abolitionist discourse, which is a rebellious manifestation of what Achille Mbembe calls Afropolitanism, enabled them to challenge abolition imperialism. So Afropolitanism is this idea of hypermobility 
actually not just within Africa, but also beyond Africa. Uh, the tendency to not recognize the constraining capacity of borders, um, the capacity to traverse boundaries, especially colonial borders. Um, being African in a global sense, understanding that there is um, authenticity in being, but also uh, cosmopolitanism in being connected uh, with the world beyond the geographical boundaries of Africa. And the knowledge, therefore, that Africa is where one is. It is not limited to one place. So this idea of Afropolitanism um, really is, become, is at play in the ways that coerced migrants challenged um, the capacity of colonial borders and contracts to keep them within sites of exploitation. One of the interesting things with, in cases like Jan Power is that then by writing petitions and calling attention to forced labor and calling out abolition as a hoax, it put British imperial officials in a position where now they have to defend forced labor, <laughs> right? And so which is a really interesting dynamic. Because imperial officials used vagrancy policies to excuse coerced contracts and dismiss African petitions about forced labor, African migrant forced laborers smuggled out letters to family members back home to advocate for their freedom. So for example, uh, just another quick example, in 1933, a Nigerian man, Edoho, received a letter from his son, Dan, who lamented that he had been inveigled into forced labor in the Spanish colony of Fernando Po. A Nigerian recruiter employed by Spanish planters and licensed by the British government promised Dan a high paying job in a British store in Fernando Po. Using a propaganda poster like this one, the recruiter portrayed Fernando Po as a space of civilization and wealth accumulation. I love this poster. It took uh, Harvard Library three months to find it, and I'm so happy they did. Um, and it was actually included in the drum magazine uh, by a journalist who disguised himself, a Nigerian journalist who disguised himself as a laborer and went to Fernando Po. And the first time he went there, they took him and showed him all the beautiful places. And then when he came back and disguised himself as a, a, a laborer, um, they tortured him and put him in prison. <laughs> and so he, and the, he found this poster, which was the, the propaganda that promises good salary, free transportation, free housing, free rations, free medical assistance, free blanket and cooking pot, eight days of leave per year. This poster, Africans are savages who are half naked, and then they get to Fernando Po and they become civilized, clothed, and they look like Europeans. The, that ha uh, cap that the African man is now wearing on the plantation is actually the uh, quintessential imagery of, of the British colonial uh, officer. Um, and so now they're supposed to look European um, and walk around on these beautiful plantations with an umbrella and do no work. So that was the propaganda uh, of recruitment. So Dan paid the recruiter 12 shillings in exchange for a forged passport purchased from a British official. The passport itself was a forgery. It bore the name Samuel Ewe. Assuming this fake identity, Dan boarded a German ship, the Wahehe, from Calabar to Fernando Po in October 1932. Upon arrival, the recruiter locked up Dan and several other Nigerian boys in a warehouse for two days. And then after two days, he marched them to a Spanish plantation where they were tortured for another two days because they refused to sign the contracts. The recruiter then took them took the boys, the Nigerian boys, to the British consulate on the island, where a British consul who also serves, served as a labor officer that was supposed to look out for the welfare of the Nigerian laborers, laborers explained their options to them. 
You could sign a contract for a meager wage or go to prison. In this way, Dan and 47 other Nigerian boys became contracted. Dan wrote that they experienced constant beatings from which some of his friends died. Constant beatings was a complaint found in almost every migrant labor petition. Hundreds of migrant, petitions from migrant laborers that I've looked at, there's a lot of references to beatings. So poorly paid, laborers could not afford food and purchased necessities on credit from the planters, who thereby obliged them to sign second contracts to pay their debts. After reading his son's letter, detailing his condition of slavery, this is Dan's word, he, called it as, he described it as slavery. Dan's father then went to a local British district officer in his district of Nigeria and initiated a process of investigation resulting in Dan's ultimate repatriation. British officials did not condemn the recruiter nor the abusive planters. Rather, they argued that Nigerians were not reluctant to go to Fernando Po, and that Spanish authorities were justified in using imprisonment to combat what they called native vagrancy. Although Dan was a victim of deceit, I am equally invested in the economy of his agency, especially his Afrotopia. That is, his capacity to imagine an Afro future beyond imperial subjugation, beyond forced labor, and beyond colonial borders. It required a lot of imagination to do that. He paid 12 shillings, assumed a forged passport identity, in the quest for a better life abroad. And when that didn't pan out, he smuggled a letter across a colonial border to family members back home to catalyze his freedom journey. So any account of the falsehood of abolition in this case would have to explain the roles of the imperial state, European planters, African recruiters, and African migrants, as well as the push and pull factors of mobility, the mediation of documents, mobility infrastructures, and human imagination. A historian would be obliged to account for imperial capitalism and rebellious Afrotopia. There are hundreds of petitions and thousands of cases like Jan Powell's and Dan's that form the stories explored in my book. These are stories about lost people, especially lost sons, husbands, and fathers, who never returned from Panya. Panya is a Nigerian equivalent of Neverland, referring to foreign plantation colonies of Spanish Equatorial Guinea, German Cameroon, and French Gabon, Thousands of young Nigerian men smuggled in boats to Panya between 1900 and 1960 never returned home. British, Spanish, German, and French states and businesses relied on the guise of free labor and the deceptive recruitment agency of mercenary African agents to traffic at least 500,000 Nigerian British subjects to these colonies in the first half of the 20th century alone. Young Nigerian men risked death abroad in the hope to earn wages to meet the burden of colonial taxation, to pay off high interest loans to local creditors, to redeem relatives from debt bondage, to support family members impoverished by colonial exploitation. Colonial land theft, price control, taxation, and urban unemployment had impoverished a majority of the population while enriching a few elites. <laughs> 
So when African people like Dan paid money to secure forged passports, they participated in abolition forgery to survive imperialism. And African subaltern forgeries helped to sustain the transcolonial forced labor system that was being disguised. Parents of young men who left for Panya deemed their sons lost. I can recall, uh, my younger brother is here, he can recall that too, <laughs> that growing up in Nigeria in the 1990s, my mother often expressed her sense of disappointing behavior by asking, Ijeko Panya, is it your plan to end up in Panya? She said, another way to say, would you become a lost son? Or she would say, is she Panya? Have you just returned from Panya? Are you a destroyed son? Growing up in the 1940s and 50s, she saw young men leave for Panya and never return. Unlike Jampao and Dan, many Nigerian indentured laborers did not return from Cameroon, Fernando Po, and Gabon. These, those foreign plantations, notorious for forced labor, but also for poor nutrition, high morbidity, and high mortality. Others returned with diseases and disabilities. These migrants exist in the imperial archives principally as names in voluminous death records, as contract numbers in colonial labor reports, and as next of kin in probate claims. What do such archival traces of loss amount to? What does a project to recover lost lives from marginal archives look like? How did tragedy become social memory? How did mortuary archives become monuments or afterlives? These archival traces of African imperial subjects like Jampao and Dan reveal European uses of forced labor as a disciplinary pedagogy of free labor in Africa after slavery's supposed end. European imperial officials, capitalists, and missionaries viewed Africans as too uncivilized for free labor. They rationalized force as necessary to teach Africans the civilizing benefits of voluntary labor. British peasants might be motivated into wage labor by the hope of improving the condition of themselves and their families, for example, but Africans must be motivated by the fear of punishment. Through acts of abolition, treaties, and conventions, European states sustained forced labor as a transitional vehicle to the full suppression of slavery. So forced labor was supposed to be transitionary, but it was transitionary from the 1820s all the way to the 1950s. But because historians have situated forced labor typically within narratives of imperiality, imperialism, really a meta-narrative of imperialism, they have not paid attention to abolition forgery, the ideologies that underpinned the whole thing. Historians have largely told the mythic structure of imperial archives, instead of confronting what we may call the underneath of things, the use of abolition's moral capital to conceal imperial violence. Hence, we have a clear imagery of slavery's bodies. So if I ask the audience, what, do you th what body image comes to mind when you think about slavery? I'm sure we'll come up with a lot of <laughs> imageries of the body. But if I ask, what did abolition's body look like? It would be a blank. Abolition blanks the body. But it is time to ask, what did abolition's bodies look like? African bodies experienced abolition as beatings and starvation, as hanging on trees, as burning with fire, as prison confinement, as penal labor, as forced labor. And that is not the story of abolition as liberation. These are things that Atlantic scholars recognize as modes of enslavement. 
abolition did not erase them, not in Africa during the 19th and 20th centuries. Rather, imperial officials and planters used the abolition discourse of free labor abstracted in the contract to mask these systems of forced labor. But the archives are filled with the voices and bodies of Africans attesting that colonial free labor laws disguised forced labor, that free labor was as disabling as slavery, that abolition was a myth. Their voices and bodies contradicted abolition texts, the treaties, the contracts, the conventions. So which archive are we looking at to write about abolition? These bodies and voices call to us from the stream of time, as it were, screaming, remember me. They demand a different account. So this is an example of what a, a French Gabon contract looked like. It's typically about five pages. So just this is the first page of it. And that's the Spanish Fernando Po contract. Uh, the one on the right is from 1956. It was a revised contract, and so it included protections. Uh, the contracts before that, the original one from 1942, did not include a lot of the protections. This, initial, the con this contract on the left, French Gabon emerged from a 1948 treaty. Um, and was trying to respond to the abuses that were found in the Spanish example. So, what kind of account? How do we then account for abolition to accommodate for the multiplicity of archives, both as texts and as bodies? I developed the theory of abolition forgery to explain how projects to end slavery led states and capitalists, as well as slaves and subjects, to mobilize liberal laws and policies, exploit freedom discourses, and forge documents, which disguise the entrenchment of slavery's political, economic, and social freedoms. The multilingual archives that um, form this project archives from Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Nigeria, Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom, revealed that African subjects used forgery to seek freedom and mobility, that imperial capitalists used it to exploit on free labor and monopolies, and that imperial states used it to achieve colonization. Without doubt, European states and capitalists most benefited from portraying abolition as a liberation project but I am also interested in how Africans use forgeries to survive and shape abolition for two reasons. First, abolition forgery generated gendered hierarchies of unfreedom in West Africa, and Africans were very much implicated in that process. Secondly, African petitions for freedom, their forgeries of freedom papers, passports, labor contracts, and marriage certificates to create autonomous informal economies, to foster mobility, to neat geographies of belonging. These were responding to, but also shaping the abolition forgeries of states and capitalists. So there's a mutuality, there's a mutual constitutiveness to these forms of forgeries that cannot be ignored. Yet, it is the myth-making process which gave abolition its moral capital that I define as forgery. So during the Q&A, please feel free to ask me about the broader historiography of forgery and abolition. But as a reminder, just a quick history lesson. Abolition began as a political project to restore the moral character of colonial institutions and imperial practices when the American Revolution constituted a crisis in British imperial authority, as well as a crisis, at least according to Eric Williams, in colonial slavery and colonial market monopolies. So abolition was responding to these forms of crisis. But abolition evolved into a global project when it became rationalized as a substitute to slavery, and it was rationalized in economic terms. Even anti-slavery advocates like Olaudo Equiano and Thomas Clarkson, as well as British businesses, argued that abolition was a gateway to African natural resources, a mode of accessing cheap labor in Africa, a medium of legitimate trade, a means of shifting the cost of emancipation from the metropole to the colonies. So this was how abolition emerged as a global capitalist response to slavery's ending, 
The desire to sustain on free labor for industrial production propped abolitionism into imperial and nationalist projects. It made abolition a powerful instrument for masking and advancing imperial and racial capitalism, not just in Africa, but around the world. Yet everywhere, subaltern resistance and forgeries shaped the local manifestations of abolition. And this dynamic between abolition forgery as a capitalist project and as survivalism is the focus of my project. So, historic acts to end slavery, including the 1807 Abolition Act, 1833 British Slavery Abolition Act, 1848 French Emancipation Act, 1865 Emancipation Proclamation, Cuba's 1886 Abolition, Brazil's Golden Law, Nigeria's Slavery Bill, all of these were moments of abolition forgery. In all cases, historians have shown, Free labor came to mean the capacity of capitalists, including those who built wealth from slavery, to use labor contracts and state laws to degrade ostensibly free laborers into unfree laborers, adding new gradations of unfreedom onto slavery. In all cases, abolition had to be enforced, and enforcing abolition subsumed antecedent subaltern freedom struggles into state-led projects of mobility, surveillance, and labor policing. So it's interesting how abolition actually has been instrumental to state-making in the modern period, at least in the modern Atlantic world. In Africa as well as in the Americas, freedom in the age of abolition required evading the surveillance state evading the state's regulation of violence, territorial claims, mediation of capitalism. So when Africans were forging passports and freedom papers and so on and so forth, they were seeking to control the economies of their own mobility beyond state control. As evident in the 1885 Berlin Conference, 1890 Brussels Conference, 1919 Paris Conference, end of World War I, and the 1930 International Labor Organization Geneva Conference. Over and over, imperial states defined colonial capitalism as projects of international supervision to eliminate slavery, to protect natives from forced labor and land seizures, to guard the moral and material welfare of native population, to eradicate arms and liquor traffic. Yet, these conferences, conventions, which constitute what we would call liberal internationalism, actually enabled states and capitalists to subjugate Africans, to seize land, to entrench forced labor, to monopolize international trade, including arms and liquor traffic. So one of the projects we've been doing at Radcliffe, my research partners have been reading the documents emerging from these conventions and analyzing them as documents of abolition forgery. It's fascinating. The <laughs> the forgery, the lies, the deception inherent in these conventions and documents. It's also been interesting to see how those conventions and treaties produce documents. So the contract of labor emerged from this. It was sort of one of the prescriptions of this conference, that you need to have a labor contract. That for uh, migrants to travel to other colonies to work, they needed to have passports. So all of these documents emerging from these conventions, freedom papers, labor contracts, passports, were also then used by Africans to negotiate mobility and to shape the local meanings and practices of abolition. So I'm gonna give quickly two examples of this. Um, <coughs> the Abolition Act itself from 1807 and the Freedom Paper. Um, are two documents. So this is sort of a, a, a history of two documents, if you will, a profile of two documents. Both types of documents facilitated what was known as redemption in West Africa. The 1807 Act empowered British officials basically to seize natives of Africa on slave ships 
after 1807 as contraband or property of the British crown and to apprentice those people, those recaptives, by force, whether they wanted it or not. And then that they would, naval officers would receive bounties for each African rescued. For an African man, 40 pounds. African woman, 30 pounds. African child, 10 pounds. And they will receive a receipt. There will be a receipt made of this payment. And these receipts are now what we now call the Liberated African Registers. Later on, when Liberated Africans, maybe they wanted to travel or wanted to show proof of emancipation, they would go to a British imperial official who consult the registers and write a testament of emancipation. Africans call those testaments freedom papers. So that is what a freedom paper looks like. By, this was from Consul Hutchinson, um, a British consul in, in, at Old Calabar um, in 1850. But beyond giving Africans freedom papers, uh, British, any British official could find an African in any part of West Africa and if they deemed the person to be a slave or in a condition of bondage, they would take the person, move, transport them to either Fernando Po, Calabar, or mostly Freetown. Often leave them in the charge of missionaries and write a freedom paper for them. But then they would be paid for that. So they were bounty hunters. That is what this sort of imperial liberation meant. But... <clears throat> Excuse me. Liberated African identity, however, was uh, latent with contradictions. And what I mean by this is they were technically liberated, but privately bonded servants. They were free, but subjugated to the state. They were African, but deemed British subjects. They were resettled, but they were displaced. So to escape imperial bondage, Liberated Africans started fleeing Freetown, this site of resettlement, of freedom, to return to parts of, coastal parts of West Africa from which they had embarked as slaves. But in returning to those places, they were not considered natives. Lo local elites did not want them there. They saw them as interlopers. And so they discriminated against them. And so these returnees, as they were called, found refuge with European missionaries, mostly. They lived mostly in missionary outstations. There, they witnessed that uh, missionaries themselves were also practicing redemption. Missionaries received African slaves as gifts from local elites. Uh, they took in fugitive slaves. They called them freed people, like the child, boy child, Harry, and the girl child, Atim, where the um, freed people awards of one of the Scottish missionary women, Miss, Mrs. Cruikshank. The so missionaries called these people freed people. In Old Calabar, local people called such African words of missionaries as they refer to them as slaves of the missionary house. Or they call them white man slaves. And in so doing, they were trying to describe the, the social marginality of those African wards, their servitude, uh, and to distinguish them from slaves of local elites. Redemption became a problem when liberated Africans like Furi and Matthews started making duplicates of their freedom paper distributing it to local slaves, who then ran away from their slave owners. And then liberated Africans would pay for the transportation of these fugitive slaves out of places like Old Calabar, take them to Fernando Po and Freetown, and sell them into bondage as indentured laborers. And what did they call that? They called it redemption. And what did they call the money they received? They called it bounty. They saw it as equivalent to what the missionaries were doing. They saw it as equivalent to what British imperial officials were doing. They wrote petitions to the British Foreign Office in London, justifying it, and the Foreign Office agreed with them that this was redemption. British imperial officials defended their actions. And it was not until 1885 
um, that redemption was criminalized. Um, Matthews and Fury arrived uh, along with uh, several hundred other uh, liberated Africans. They left Freetown, they took this boat, and after 20 days, they landed in Old Calabar. Um, and then a year later, they were deported from, Freetown, from Old Calabar back to Freetown on charges of slave trading because they stole slaves just from the wrong local elite who was too powerful and who insisted they had to be deported. The reason why liberated Africans felt doubly marginalized in a, in a place like Old Calabas is, was that Liverpool merchants especially had monopolized the palm oil, transatlantic palm oil trade there. And lacking other avenues of, inc of economic pursuit, many of the returnees turned to practices of redemption as a way to make uh, money. So local elites denounced liberated Africans as slave stealers, as slave traders. British consuls were torn. Some defended uh, liberated Africans as advancing the extinction of slavery, quote unquote, by practicing redemption. Others argued that they were slave trading. The Foreign Office prevaricated um, and said we, whatever that these liberated Africans had to be protected. But in 1885, in order to protect domestic slavery, slavery as, as it existed in the region, and in order to get the local elites to sign a treaty making Old Calabar a British protectorate, British consuls declared redemption illegal and criminalized it. They rationalized that slavery must be managed with tact and deliberation to ensure it did not become an obstacle to colonization. Abolition was a means of achieving colonial civilization. So it was fascinating why redemption was criminalized. Not because it was inhumane, but because it threatened slaveholding elites and it threatened slavery in Old Calabar. And they wanted Old Calabar as a protectorate, so they abolished redemption. The criminalization of redemption in 1885 led to a situation where forced labor recruitment went underground. It mushroomed throughout the region. In between the 1890s and 1930s, about 300,000 Nigerians would be smuggled in canoes and marched through forests to German plantations in Cameroon, Spanish plantations in Fernando Po. Laborers would flee Cameroon and Fernando Po to get to French Gabon, where they would encounter another system of forced labor in timber forests. All colonial plantation systems were sites of unfree labor. In the 1940s, the British government signed treaties with Spain and France to regulate the supply of another 200,000 indentured treaty laborers from Nigeria to Spanish Equatorial Guinea and to French Gabon. Like the 1807 Abolition Act, which basically legitimized redemption, like the abolition of redemption, which legitimized local slavery, the treaties legitimized transcolonial traffic in forced labor. Forced laborers wrote to newspapers publicizing forced labor, inspiring Nigerian nationalism. Fernando Po was the favorite place for Nigerian nationalists to visit in the 1940s and 50s because they'll visit and they'll come back and they'll call a press conference and just list all the atrocities there. And we're basically using the forced labor situation in Fernando Po to say colonialism must end now. So abolition forgery fed young men to Panya, but also women and children who, though they existed beyond the veil of contracts, populated the archives with feverish fantasies of freedom. So if we think back to um, 
Furia Matthews, the two liberated Africans that came to Old Calabar were exiled for uh, uh, redemption. They experienced a peculiar form of precarity in Old Calabar because they returned without wives and children. British administrators in Sierra Leone issued freedom papers only to male liberated Africans. Such that liberated African men and women depended on being wards to men to validate their status as emancipated persons. So imperial subjecthood was paternalistic. So we, liberated African women and children did not receive freedom papers, only men. So you had to belong to a man to then benefit from the protection of that. So these men then, it enabled men to claim rights to the labor of women and children. Many of those who successfully settled were those that came with women and children. So that even if they didn't make it, they relied on the labor, uh, agricultural and commercial labor of their, of their wives and children to survive. So in many ways, Furia and Matthews were an exception <laughs> in not being able to settle. But there are many like them. So many liberal African women wrote petitions. People like, women like Amelia McIntosh, Hannah Boyle, and Sarah Boyd. Amelia wrote, my husband John McIntosh has long treated me in a very shameful manner. He repeatedly has beaten me. Um, the case of Hannah, it, it, it ended up tragically. And during q and I can more take time to contextualize and, and explain more the, uh, the mother's suicide. Um, in the case of um, Hannah Boyle and Robert Boyle. But what I'm getting to here with this example um, is to say that returnees had to perform what I call Anglo-cosmopolitan or Afropolitan masculinity. Uh, as a British consul put it, Christian conversion and freedom papers enabled liberated Africans to become black Englishmen who achieved the health and vigor of manhood. Performing Anglo-cosmopolitan masculinity or Afropolitan masculinity was an aspirational and survivalist assertion of hierarchical gender relations. It was a way for people who had, men who had been displaced to recover patriarchal dividend in a society that marginalized them. And so relative subjugation, the subjugation of women and children, became part of the survivalism of returnee men. And this leads me to the concept of what I'm calling wife owning, the way that Afropolitan masculinity uh, is manifested or is performed as the subjugation of women, as the assertion of hierarchical gender relations. Wife owning required the mobilization of certain types of documents, freedom papers, petitions, and marriage certificates. Through such documents, liberated African men sought to exploit women's bodies, labor capacities, and sexual economies. And it is striking that African male bodies experience free labor in the plantations but women bore the burden of care for these male laboring bodies and also bore the scars and fatalities of abolition's domestic violence. A survey of 400 Nigerian indentured laborers returning from Fernando Po in the first half of the 20th century showed that majority of people risked forced indenture because they wanted to earn money to pay debts, to escape, escape debt bondage, but also to earn money to marry wives, to buy a bicycle for business, to assist parents or relatives, to buy farming land. So recruiters will use this promise of social recovery to lure young men into forced indenture. But the survey also reveals that abolition paternalism fused the social mobility aspirations of male imperial subjects with the labor exploitation schemes of imperial states and colonial capitalists. Abolition forgery generated hierarchies of unfreedom and made heteropatriarchal kinship the basis of colonial capitalism. 
husband did not always mean wife owner in this region. It was part of, it was a product of abolition factory. It was a product of the uses of imperial liberation, labor treaties, labor contracts, juridical certification of marriage, certific uh, um, va juridical uh, validation of marriage certificates. So when we look at the abolition treaty that Britain signed with Spain and France in the 1940s, for example, the treaties provided that each male laborer would be entitled to two wives to incentivize indenture. It required that all migrant women had to register as wives of migrant men. You could not leave Nigeria to Fernando Po, to Gabon, or to Cameroon as an, um, an independent businesswoman. You could only go as the wife of an indentured male laborer. Transcolonial laborers lived in squalid camps, in makeshift homes. They suffered myriad health disability, including especially feet rot diseases. Failing to provide care facilities, planters relied on wives to provide care. So the forced labor system relied on an economy of care that was gendered. And the fantasy of African wives as caregivers to male laborers informed labor recruitment. Laborers received incentives if they could convince wives and children to come with them. So the result, hundreds and hundreds of petitions from young male migrants to British imperial officials asking for wives. In this example, a woman, Akon, runs away from her home in Calabar to escape the agents of the Anglo-Spanish Employment Agency who came to seize her and take her to Gabon to join her husband, Udoka. So she, in his letter, Udoka says, I see no reason why she should refuse to join me unless she wants to increase the number of halots in Calabar, Nigeria as a whole. So this is uh, Udoka's letter. And he produces, but he produced no evidence of bride price payment. Um, and so um, Akon refused to join. But agents and the British... Uh, colonial official at Calabar kept harassing this woman, and so she runs away from Calabar to her maternal home to escape um, being forced to join her husband. But hundreds of women were forcefully mobilized to join their husbands. And, and interestingly, responding to this uh, patri forgery of patriarchy, as it were, women registered themselves in colonial courts as wives of male laborers. They filled out forms saying, saying wives wishing to join husbands. Uh, many of them mobilized fake relatives to attest to non-existent customary marriages, supplied affidavits, sat down for photographs, took those photographs to court, and produced these fake marriage certificates from colonial courts, which enabled them to then travel. And when they got to their destination, they abandoned the husbands, who then wrote letters and petitions that their wives had run away. Um, and in this case, um, Samuel Johnson writes that his wife was a child trafficker. And the wife writes, well, he, he's complaining because I left him. <laughs> we were business partners. We were trafficking children together. Um, and so basically you had women who were using the court registration of marriage to claim kidnapped children as theirs, to traffic them across borders, use them as domestic servants or or sell them as domestic laborers on these plantations. So one of the things I'm looking at in this, project, in this project is also the forgery of wifehood and the forgery of motherhood as a counter-rebellious strategy that women were using uh, to respond to this patriarchal forgery. So, just a few concluding remarks. We know that forced labor has persisted today. Um, but continues to be masked by neoliberal discourses of democracy, of development. For example, forced labor in Africa generates an estimated $13.1 billion in profits annually for private companies of the West, and this forced labor is masked with the discourse of development. Child labor is prevalent, sex 
traffic is prevalent. In 2018, Amnesty International reported that African children are forced into labor to produce materials used by Tesla, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Dell. The so-called greening of Africa, or production of materials for electric energy or clean energy, continues to rely on forced labor that remains invisible. These are all the afterlives of slavery, from forced labor to mass incarceration to Black Lives Matter. These are ways that slavery has endured. What I'm doing in this project is to show that the way has not been theorized as such, has not been named. That abolition forgery is one of the ways that the afterlife of slavery was manufactured. Capitalism is such a broad term, it doesn't tell us exactly, it doesn't characterize a process of reinventing the unfreedoms previously associated with slavery. Abolition forgery does. Africa is well positioned to understand these dynamics, but continues to be left out of the conversation. The petitions, the moral outrage, the contradictory practice of abolition, underground forgeries that Africans enacted contributed to many of the neoliberal policies enshrined in the International Labor Organization's conventions. So some of the policy things we are familiar with today and we take for granted that govern labor, um, you know, salary, uh, health benefits, and so on. As for these were things that emerged from the petitions of imperial subjects who found themselves in positions of forced labor and wrote petitions, and these petitions made it into the floor of the International Labor Organization. And now they become conventions adopted by states, and we take them for granted. So, my project positions these as also part of the growing pains of Afrofuturist imagination emerging from um, African abolition forgeries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Du mm -hmm. So I've asked our I, I've AV team if we can go like five minutes early. Thank Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few questions that I think um, we should answer. Um, I hope that's okay with the audience. Um, you use the word forgery mm -hmm. in opposing ways mm -hmm. for colonial neo slavery and for Africans' resistance to neo slavery. Mm -hmm. Would it be helpful to use two different terms for? No. Um, the, it's, um, Africans use forgery. Uh, African agency, uh, abolition forgery would not have, have happened the way it did without African agency. Uh, in, many of, in many ways, the imperial state was responding to African innovations. Um, the, the dynamic between uh, uh, European planters and African laborers often preceded the responses of the imperial state. Uh, the problem was that the imperial state did not always respond through abolition and through uh, criminalization and, 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 and policy change. Um, they followed the initiative of capitalists colonial capitalists. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, some of the, much of the underground economies of transcolonial forced labor, where the initiatives of, began with the liberated Africans, right, who were forging freedom papers and using it to traffic uh, others. Um, it was not until 1940s that the British state legitimizes that. But it went on from the 1850s all the way to the 1940s before the state. Rather, the state exploited it to achieve colonization, to achieve surveillance by you know, issuing passports, issuing travel permits. Uh, when we think about colonialism, it's, it's often easy to think about it as a fait accompli. Uh, 
But I look at colonialism in my project as a process, as a struggle. Subjectification itself, the process of making subjects, making people into subjects of the state required um, the, uh, the state to exhibit control over people. And one side of control was control over mobility yeah. by controlling passports. So uh, it's amazing how the British Imperial State, for example, builds up a complex institution of colonial surveillance and co border control and mobility control through the uh, forced labor uh, trafficking system. Yeah. Yeah. A question about, uh, so le le let me read it out. Was abolitionism forgery pervasive throughout Nigeria or limited to certain ethno-linguistic ethno groups or regions? Mm, excellent. Um, so when we think about forced labor in Africa, um, in, really in, in, in colonial Africa, uh, King Leopold's Congo is probably the most forceful imagery. And it's often told as a story of imperialism or colonialism, but it is a quintessential story of abolition in and of itself. The ideologies of um, the association um, that was supposed to go and civilize the region, um, the, the ideologies that produced um, this association uh, that leads to the role that Belgium will lead in, you know, at the Berlin Conference. Um, all of those were part of uh, the abolition, um, the construction of, ab as, or the exploitation of abolition's moral capital, mm -hmm. even though it hasn't been theorized as such, right? Uh, so King, if you, if you, a close reading of King Leopold's Ghost, you'll see this discourse of free labor, free trade, over and over, and civilization, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the civilizing mission. Uh, which is um, another a, reiteration, a different iteration of abolition's moral capital at play. Abolition forgery is also not limited to Africa per se. Um, I mean, historians of Brazil, Cuba have been describing abolition forgery, even if they haven't named it as such. So one only has to read uh, Sidney Ch uh, Chaloub's. Uh, works on Brazil and on abolition to see, I mean, and Chaluba has written extensively on the contract, right? Um, even one year before 1888, the golden law in Brazil uh, to abolish uh, slavery completely, um, the initial plan was uh, a compromise uh, that would require slaves to negotiate for their own freedom. And Chaluba writes that they walked out mm -hmm. uh, of plantations and then forcing the state to. And the road to abolition in Brazil is just a congeries of forgeries and compromises, right? Um, a close reading of Black Reconstruction, W. Du Bois' work, um, he was describing abolition forgery, even though he wasn't naming it as such. Uh, uh, du Bois writes ab about abolition forgery as promising freedom with one hand and institutionalizing our freedom with the other. He writes out of Reconstruction as a movement back towards slavery, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, the Pro Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery in a single stroke, even though it institutionalized black on freedom. So there were, it required, um, you know, subsequent struggles, including the civil rights movement, to achieve emancipation. I mean, if there's one thing that Dubois clarifies is that emancipation was a myth, and that even the myth of history is part of the propaganda of emancipation as a faith accompli. Um, free labor, free trade discourses were instrumental to the reinvention of forced labor systems after slavery's supposed end across uh, the Caribbean and in Brazil and Cuba. In, in Brazil, it took the form of uh, mechanized agriculture where uh, northern, U.S. northern investors were considered, as my colleague writes, every machine as an abolitionist, even though that these machines were increasing um, sugar production and expanding on free labor in Brazil. Right. Well, this is all we have time today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Ndubueze. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you the audience for your questions. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe events. You can find more information and videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Yeah.